Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. We hope you've enjoyed our Serve the Nation's emphasis these last few weeks. We're wrapping up today by focusing on Central and South Asia. As believers, we have to always be thinking outwards, and mission trips are an easy and meaningful way to do that. After service, visit us in the comments or go to missions.westb.org for more. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. Creation cries, oh. 
Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked, so Satan could not deceive the nations any more until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and unholy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be led out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations, called Gog and Magog, in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army, as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. A fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Where? Where is heaven? Now, Scripture gives us some indication. Scripture tells us that heaven is upward. If you look at Revelation chapter 20, it says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. So there is an upward view of heaven. When Lucifer rebelled against God, what position did he want? Let's let's go there. Isaiah 14. Let me read you just a couple of verses here in Isaiah 14. Look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Satan, or Lucifer here, wanted an upward position. I I want to be above God. I want to ascend there. I want to climb there. When Jesus was, well, when he returned to heaven, he was taken up, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Ephesians 4 gives us this language about Jesus descending and ascending. 
So there's this idea that heaven is upward. And when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he was thrown down. But the location of heaven is less about the direction and more about the realm. Uh, there is um, there is a current location of heaven. Um, sometimes it's called the intermediate state. You know, when you die, you're immediately with Jesus. Uh, but heaven is currently a construction project because Jesus is preparing a place for you. And, and there is a future place. To, to die and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, of course. And so when, when you pass, even those who have passed and are, will, will pass before Christ returns, there's an intermediate state. Um, you're in heaven, but it's kind of the heaven that's being constructed. And we're waiting on that completion, which is yet to occur. This concept can be a bit confusing, but I, I think, in, think in terms of maybe like a dream home. You know, you've bought the land, to build your home. It's in the process. It's yours. You know, you've paid for it. It's done. Uh, it will be done. Uh, but you're kind of living in your current home, which is just fine. But that final place, you're, you're, you're waiting for that final place. It's kind of the way heaven is right now. It's a, it's a big construction project. Your home is secure, though. Jesus is building it. The home will be completed, but there is this intermediate time, this inter intermediate state that's necessary until it's done. Now, I want to take you to John 14, connect it to Revelation 20. Same author, John wrote his gospel. He also wrote the book of Revelation. Let's just look at the first three verses here in John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, that you will always, uh, so that you will always be with me and where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. Your heart must not be troubled. How? Believe in me, Jesus says. Why would you believe in Jesus? I have a place for you. I'm creating this place. Heaven is being built. And I want you there, Jesus says. Every person needs a home. That idea of needing a home is, is built within us. It's, it's you know, where we belong. It's where we fit. It's where community makes sense. You know, but sometimes um, my childhood home was in St. Petersburg, Florida, close to downtown. And, um, you know, I have all these fond memories of growing up in that house. And every now and then when I'm in the area, I will drive by it. And though it is the same color and the same size, it's not exactly the way that I remember it. Um, in fact, it is much, much, much smaller uh, than the way I remember it. It's kind of anticlimactic because it's, it's not my home anymore. Somebody else lives there. And, and so there's this idea that, you know, any place on earth for us is a bit inadequate. It's unfulfilling. Why? Because our home is in heaven. Our home is with Jesus. Our fulfillment should be found in our Father's house. We want to be with Jesus in his kingdom. And ultimately, when we pass away, that's where we're brought into. You know, I remember my the, the, the funeral of my grandma. We called her Nana. Um, and Nana had a great sense of humor. Um, and, and she she really loved awkward things. And I think it's genetic in my family. I just, if it's awkward and it makes people feel a little uncomfortable, I'm, I'm laughing. I, I, I enjoy those moments. And uh, there was a moment at Nana's funeral, actually, um, where my family and I just could not hold back our laughter. What happened was um, they had brought in a casket from a different, side of the church through a different door. And the plan was for the pallbearers to pick up the casket and take it out another door. But this was a really old church and they forgot to measure the doorway when it comes to the size of the casket. And so at the end of the service, you know, people are, it's a very somber moment. It's a funeral, of course. And, you know, we watch this procession of people uh, that are from the funeral home try to take the, the casket out of the door that they had thought that they would go through, but it doesn't 
fit and you can just see their minds turning. You know, what, what do you do? Do you go back through the other door? That's really awkward just to turn around and go back the other way. Do you tilt the casket slightly to try to get it through the door? And, you, you know, you, you can kind of see a couple of them kind of thinking maybe that's what sh- we should do. But then you, you begin thinking, well, man, this thing's not really sealed shut yet. And what if Nana rolls out of the casket? You know, that would be even more awkward. And so me and my family are just, I mean, we've got tears rolling. We're not really crying. We're, we're laughing at this point. Nana would have loved that moment. And I bring that up only because Nana longed for heaven and, and, and she was ready. She was in an age and she was at a state of health where she was, she was ready. How you wait for heaven is critically important. Are you eager for eternity and, 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 and hard at work in the here and now? Are, are you, or, or are, you, are you anxious in your faith and, and paralyzed by fear? Are you apathetic towards heaven and, and lazy in your faith? We need to wait knowing that this place is the best place of all. Heaven is more than a state of mind. It's a real place. Is there a place called heaven? Yes, it's, you know, when Jesus ascended, he didn't ascend into a a state of mind, he returned to heaven, an actual place. And there's only one way to heaven. I wanna be very clear with you. John 14, six says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus tells us only through him can we get to heaven. Only through him can we know who God is. And without repentance, you, you will remain in his wrath. But when you accept his grace through Christ, heaven is your final destination. Do you remember from a few weeks ago? Um, there are two judgments, uh, the, the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. And if you look at Revelation 20, specifically verse 11, there, there is this great white throne judgment. Um, and when, when it all ends, there's going to be these two judgments, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne throne judgment. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, um, this is Roman, Romans 14 talks about this, and it reveals that we as believers will give an account for our actions. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is for those who are already saved, those who will go into heaven. And before we go into heaven, uh, we will be judged according to our works in a sense, but then it, which obviously are inadequate on their own. We can't work our way to heaven, um, but then we're viewed through the righteousness of Christ. And so amazingly, you know, at this judgment, you know, God's going to hold us accountable for the things that we did wrong, but he ultimately views us through Christ's righteousness. And, and because of that, we are glorified into heaven. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And But unbelievers, those who don't know Christ, they stand before the great white throne judgment, which Revelation 20 talks about. And this is where God will issue judgment for those who have rejected Christ. Those standing before the first throne are viewed through the righteousness of Christ. Those standing before the second throne are judged according to their own righteousness. And there's no righteousness within us that can save us. We need Christ's righteousness. Now, Revelation 20 also mentions this thousand year reign. What do we make of the thousand year reign of Christ? Now there's three views of the millennium. The millennium represent millennium meaning thousand years. And we've gone through this before, but just, you know, at at an earlier uh, point in this series, but I want to review this briefly because it is a very important thing and debated. Lots of people debate this. So there's the view of the all millennialist or all millennialism, where those who hold to this view say that Christ reigns with the saints during an unknown time period, that the thousand years is just a mere symbol. Then you have post-millennialism, which those who hold to this view say that Christ returns after the thousand year reign. And then you have the premillennial view or premillennialism which says Christ returns before the thousand year reign. And that thousand year reign is a literal 
thousand years. Now, most of you, if you really are into this, you've kind of figured out where I stand at this point in the series. I am a post-tribulation pre-millennialist. I believe that the church will experience the tribulation, that it will be particularly intense for three and a half years. And at the end of the tribulation, Christ will return before reigning for a literal 1,000 year period. That's my view. I realize that there are other teachers of the Bible, preachers who are orthodox, who hold to different views. Um, so I want to respect those views while at the same time being clear where, where I stand. I do believe that there is a chronological sequence to the latter part of Revelation. I think there is something to a timeline here. I think some can overdo the timeline, of course, but there is something to the, the timeline here. And if you look at it, you see that there is this intense tribulation for three and a half years. And we get the, the seal and the trumpet and the bold judgments during this time, which we've talked about at length in previous sermons in this series. Then Christ returns and Jesus defeats evil at Armageddon. The Antichrist, that is the beast, is, is thrown into the lake of fire. And Babylon, which is the system of corruption, begins to, to fall apart. It's at this point that Satan is imprisoned and, and Jesus begins in an earthly reign of a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, Satan is released. And perhaps you've noticed in Revelation 20 that there's this one final rebellion. We'll talk about that here in a moment. After this final rebellion, the great white throne judgment occurs. And then finally, we enter into hopefully the eternal state of heaven. I don't want anybody to enter into the eternal state of hell. Neither does Jesus. He wants you to accept him and to be in his kingdom. Now, the millennium is this intermediate kingdom of a thousand years before the establishment of a final eternal state, which is heaven and hell. Now, why a literal 1,000 years? Well, ultimately, only God knows. But every time scripture uses the term year, it seems to mean a literal time period. So I'm, I'm going to stick with that as to, to why do we hold to a literal 1,000 years. Now, another question found in Revelation 20, why is Satan released? Okay, so Satan is defeated at Armageddon. He's in prison for a thousand years while Jesus reigns. And then he's released again. Why does that happen? And I think there's a very simple answer here. It's to demonstrate that even a thousand years of confinement does not alter Satan's plans. It, you know, you locked up for a thousand years and he still rebels. And what, what does this tell us about ourselves? People will still choose rebellion even in a near perfect environment with no satanic temptation. So there's this one final rebellion that we get and it's described specifically in verses eight and nine. Uh, the Gog and Magog reference here are actually uh, pointing to back to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and represents the enemies of God among the nations of the world, but they are quickly defeated and Satan ultimately is thrown into the lake of fire which represents hell. Revelation 20 continues the pattern that we've seen throughout this book, a pattern of judgment and salvation. Are you on the path of unrighteousness to the lake of fire, or are you on the path of righteousness to the book of life? Bottom line is we need Jesus to defeat evil and we need Jesus to save us. Verses four through six in Revelation 20 reveal a, a group of believers who were martyred for their faith uh, during the tribulation. So they stand up for Jesus and they're martyred for, for the cause of Christ during, during the tribulation period. Uh, this group was previously mentioned in Revelation 6 and also Revelation 13. Here they are again in Revelation 20. This group in Revelation 20 um, that's mentioned here, they they experience the worst of the worst during the tribulation. And they don't worship the Antichrist. They don't fall for his schemes. And ultimately they lose their lives because of it. Another question that we find here in Revelation 20, and one that I wanna to try to answer at least in part, is 
have you ever wondered if God really cares about his children that go through the worst of it? I mean, some Christians seem to experience horrific hardships. You know, does God care about that? And he does. In fact, what's revealed in the text is that there is a special reward for endurance through suffering. Let me give you uh, an example um, of this. Several years ago, uh, I, 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 I was in my PhD program and I wanted to explore, at least academically, theoretically, why atheists can be so sure that there is no God. And I started reading many of the leading thinkers in atheism just to try to understand. And, and I came across uh, Christopher Hitchens. He's, he's one of many, uh, but the one that I ended up gravitating towards the most. He was such an independent thinker. There, there was lots of them that had agendas and you could tell there was an agenda and Christopher Hitchens probably did too. But he was the one that, that seemed to be the most independent in his thinking. He held a selection of views that was atypical. Let me just say that. He seemed to offend everybody because he was pro-life, complicated view there for him, but pro-life, pro-gun rights, but also pro-same-sex marriage and pro-drugs. And I don't know if there's anyone on the planet that holds to that selection of views, except for him. So I found his independent thinking fascinating, and I kept, I kept reading. Then something tragic happened in his life. He received a cancer diagnosis. Here's what he wrote at that time. He says, in whatever kind of race life may be, I have very abruptly become a finalist. And it's at this point that he started to write his final work. He knew he was dying, so he wrote a book called Mortality. Don't know if it was his best book, but it was the one that really resonated with me. Um, he would die 18 months later in 2011. And those last months became his last stand of what he would call anti-theism. You know, a, a view that belief in God destroys individual freedom. He's all about individual freedom. Ironically, his view of freedom did not free him from the bondage of death. Who was Christopher Hitchens? He was a leading intellectual. I mean, very few people could match his wit and commentary. He was a voluminous writer, sharp profound, offending both the left and the right. He was a, a fierce enemy of organized religion and, and one of the most notable critics of God. And he woke up on June 8th, 2010, as he writes in this memoir, to the feeling that he was shackled to my own corpse, he says. It was the beginning of the end for him. And from that point on, he wrote feverishly, he wrote brilliantly, until you get to the last words that he ever wrote in this book, Mortality. It's the way the last chapter ends. And, and here's what he writes. He says, no one ever comes into his own. Such is the cost of immortality. No person is whole. No person is free. He died December 15th, 2011. He debated the, the great Christian thinkers he heard the gospel. Christopher Hitchens heard the gospel over and over and over again, but he stood firm. He debated fiercely, and yet the one thing he stood for, which was individual freedom, was quite quickly and abruptly taken from him. My analysis of Hitchens is that he was brilliant but blind, and his suffering through cancer simply brought more darkness into his life. Christians suffer differently. We should, at least. If you look at Stephen, the, the first Christian martyr, or these martyrs in Revelation 20, 
you know, Stephen um, in the book of Acts is, is often identified as the first Christian martyr. He, as he's dying, as he's, as he's suffering, what happens? As he's being killed, he sees the light that gives him assurance as he suffers. It's not darkness. Unfortunately, Christopher Hitchens only experienced darkness through suffering. Christians can see light even as they suffer. Everyone can suffer and everyone will to some degree because we all die. What makes suffering different for believers? Very simple. In Christ, suffering has a point. Pain can be used by God for his glory. And when you suffer for Christ, you will be rewarded, which is part of the key message of Revelation 20. It's the cross that shows us how the greatest evil can be used for the greatest good. Perhaps R.C. Sproul said it best. Famous quote, I'll share it with you. Why do bad things happen to good people? That only happened once and he volunteered. Thank you for worshiping through our digital service. Please visit us at westb.org for more information about our church.